Okay. So for those of you that have just entered, welcome. Uh, go to www.menti.com or you can scan that QR code. And during this meeting, we'll ask you a couple of questions using the uh, Menti tools. The code that you enter is 24719021. And right now, there's not a question to be answered yet. We're just uh, waiting to gather some people. I think they're in the waiting room. They're being admitted. Just let me know, Rachel, when uh, when you want me to go ahead. You're muted, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you. I had muted myself. Um, there are a few more people who have registered who okay. ha haven't joined us yet, but I think you can go ahead and um, jump to the first question. Okay. So our first question before the meeting begins is what does resiliency mean to you? And that's just open-ended, uh, type in whatever you feel. So far, we've got four or five answers. If anybody else wants to type in their answer, what does resiliency mean to you? If you were just admitted, um, direct your browser smartphone to www.menti.com and then you enter the code 24719021. And that will be uh, where you go during this meeting to answer any questions that we might prompt you with. Don't be bashful. <laughs> I think we have, I'm not sure how many we have attending right now, but I've gotten four answers so far. We'll wait until we get a few more answers before we okay. um, All right. show the results. So if you haven't done so already, and feel free to use the chat if you are having issues um, logging into menti.com. It's not a requirement either. <laughs> just, mm -hmm. just for us to get some idea of uh, what you think about resiliency before and then certainly during uh, after the webinar. All right, we can go ahead and start showing the answers. So some of the answers, um, well, you can read. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see how close they come to uh, what we discussed here today. Ability to sustain society on current resources without jeopardizing the needs of future generations, changing, adjusting to meet the current need of the environment, how we respond to natural disasters, adaptable, ability to withstand or recover quickly from difficulties, Resilience is the ability to withstand adversity and bounce back from difficult life events. Wonderful answers. I'm not sure if we even need to, to give our webinar, but we are going to give you a few more details um, from both regional, uh, state, regional, and local perspectives. All right. Do you want me to take over um, 
and start the PowerPoint now, Mo? Sure, that sounds good. Thank you. So the um, Mentimeter will still be available uh, for anyone who has not had the chance to answer the question yet. And uh, don't close your browser because we will be asking you some questions at the end of the webinar. Um, so thank you for joining us today on our community webinar for resiliency and environmental stewardship. Um, the city of Titusville partnered with the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council and UF IFAS Brevard County Extension to conduct this educational program from June of last year to June of this year to communicate and facilitate conversations related to environmental resiliency in context of the Florida statute uh, 380.093. And uh, this publication uh, and webinar and this whole, this whole series was funded in part through a grant agreement with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection the Florida Coastal Management Program by a grant provided by the Office of Ocean and Coastal Management. Um, so thank you so much to our grantors for letting us host this program. Um, and you can continue to read the rest of the statement. So thank you to all of our partners and the Florida Department of Environmental Protection um, for sponsoring or for allowing us um, to host this webinar. So an overview of the grant and for those who have attend, um, who recently joined in, um, this webinar is being recorded and we'll, we will have it available on YouTube afterwards if you would like to share it uh, with your friends and family. So an over overview of the webinar, we have our introductions and objectives. Why are we here? Knowledge gaps and strategies and resiliency strategies and decision making. And hopefully we'll have time at the end for a Q&A. And um, we haven't introduced ourselves yet, but here now we have a great opportunity to. My name is Rachel Muller. I am the sustainability planner with the city of Titusville. And we are joined by Holly Abels and Michelle Morrison. And I'll give them both an opportunity to introduce themselves. And we'll start with you, Mo. Yes, I'm uh, Michelle, also known as Mo uh, Morrison with the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council. I'm a planner and I'm currently working on a couple of nature-based solutions uh, for resilience um, projects, as well as comprehensive plan rewrites. Yeah, and I'm Holly Beals. I'm uh, the Florida Sea Grant Extension Agent with University of Florida IFAS Extension in Brevard County. Um, and along with working with Mo and Rachel on this project, I've um, worked with the city of Cape Canaveral on um, community engagement workshops and planning um, for um, things like flooding um, and in general do community engagement um, and education around um, resiliency and environmental education in general. All right, thank you guys. So, We'll jump right in, uh, start with why are we here? Why did you all join us this, this lovely afternoon? Uh, thank you again for joining us. In 2019, the city adopted a vulnerability assessment and resiliency plan to comply with the Florida state statute that we have mentioned. Um, and this was done in partnership with the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council, and it addressed the city's vulnerabilities to natural disaster and sea level rise, as well as water quality threats. And I'll go more into detail about what the vulnerability assessment and resiliency plan said later on in the webinar. Later on in the webinar. Uh, but part of what the resiliency plan stated was that the city needed to do some outreach and stu stewardship programs to get the community on board to making sure that we are all aware of what is necessary and needed for the city of Titusville to become more resilient. Um, and so in 2022, the city received grant funding from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to conduct this resiliency stewardship program, which we started do with, which you may have remembered, our community surveys and our staff surveys. And we use this community survey and our staff survey to inform the outreach and education we have been conducting since uh, the start of 2023. 
And then beginning in 2024, a vulnerability assessment meeting the new requirements of the Florida statute will be a requirement to receive infrastructure funding. So as of right now, the city's vulnerability assessment um, will need to be updated to comply with the new Florida statute to receive infrastructure funding. And the city um, is looking to, to get the vulnerability assessment updated within the next year or two, depending on when that funding becomes available for the city. But part of that requires of requires us letting the community know uh, what our intentions are and how we continue to update and monitor the city's uh, threats. And so I'll I'll leave it to Mo to um, continue on. So we're all here to learn a little bit more about resiliency. I work with the Regional Planning Council and we, we work with eight different counties, uh, 78 municipalities. So as a region, we define resiliency as the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a region to plan, sustain, adapt, recover, improve, and grow collaboratively, regardless of the chronic stressors and acute shocks they experience. So um, you can see the, the range goes all the way from this regional perspective, all the way down to the individual. So keep that in mind as we go through today's webinar. Next slide. So let's start with defining what we mean by a shock. Uh, we have acute shock. This is a sudden event, natural disaster, disease out, outbreak, or even infrastructure failure. I think all of these things <laughs> have been very recently experienced. And, and you know when an acute shock happens. Next slide. Something that's uh, not as well defined as an acute shock or, or not as noticed is a chronic stressor. This is a recurring pressure that weakens the fabric of a community. These are things such as lack of affordable housing, homelessness, poverty, and Interestingly, I think we can all also agree that um, chronic stressors can be exacerbated by acute shock. For example, a flooding event can magnify stresses already being experienced by residents living in substandard housing or lacking the financial means to temporarily relocate and recover. Um, as far as the pandemic, a dramatically increased joblessness, inability to pay for housing and basic needs, mental illness, and business failures. So this is what we talk about also when we talk about resiliency. Next slide. We, at the beginning of our project, we conducted two surveys, uh, one with the staff and one with the residents. And we had overwhelming support um, and participation from the residents. Over 500 people participated in the survey and 412 completed it. This was um, way more than we had expected for uh, your population here in Titusville, 40, uh, just over 48,000. And staff also took the survey. Many of the same questions were on both surveys and in the staff uh, survey, all departments completed the survey. So just one of the questions that came out was, are you familiar with techniques to create resiliency in Titusville? And it listed some techniques. So only about a third of the people felt that, that they were very informed or moderately informed. So two thirds of the people did not. Um, and we're looking today to try to bump that up into the moderately and very informed about what Titusville is doing towards resiliency. Next slide. So if you look at this, we're, we're breaking vulnerabilities down into three pillars, people, prosperity, and place. And when we look at people, not only residents, but business owners and community groups, prosperity will generally refer to your economy, but also training and education that lead into uh, somebody getting employment. And then place is not only um, the, your 
natural environment, but also your built environment. And this helps anchor um, people and prosperity to your place, which is Titusville here. So you can note some similarities. Um, the blue text is indicating what staff felt were the top three vulnerabilities for people, prosperity and place. And the green came out of the resident survey. And there were quite a few similarities in what staff and residents felt. Um, the perceived vulnerabilities of housing insecurity and homelessness, inflation, poverty, lack of everyday resources, low wages, lack of infrastructure maintenance. Uh, but something to notice here is when you look at place, what did residents see as the top related vulnerability for Indian River Lagoon Health? Uh, so this, this webinar here today focuses on many practices, principles, things that can be done by not only the resident, but also the municipalities in protecting that. Next slide, please. So we've been talking about this resilient Florida statute. Here's a part of it. Uh, and basically it's telling you that the state recognizes that we're vulnerable to adverse impacts from flooding resulting from increases in frequency and duration of rainfall events, storm surge from more frequent and severe weather systems and sea level rise. And these adverse impacts pose economic, social, environmental and public health and safety challenges to the state. So you see all three categories, people, prosperity of places are affected by this vulnerability. Next slide, please. This is just a, a little bit to show you what goes on in the background uh, in your municipality and throughout the region are these flood maps. And these are just flood maps from 2040, predicting 2040. Um, you have the sea level rise and then on top of that storm surge. And you can see the red is a cat one all the way out to uh, lavender color cat five. On the left, you have lower bound estimates. These are predictions and um, to the right, you have the upper bound. And if Rachel uh, advances the slide, you can, you can watch it change in 30 years. And if you wanna go back to the slide before, you know, you can, you can see what, what the difference 30 years would make and what kind of coverage flooding may present. Okay, next slide, please. So Rachel mentioned your um, vulnerability assessments, and those have been done before, but now with the statute, there are uh, some changes. And we're looking at some changes in the flood maps. Um, it's also, we need to look at um, 2040 and 2070, as I showed you, but also storm surge, and we're looking at the impact on critical assets, things like roads, wastewater facilities, schools, fire stations, hospitals, senior residences, and sometimes even looking at your um, cultural, um, historic, and your natural environment assets within the city. Next slide, please. Some additional things considered in uh, the vulnerability assessments are rainfall induced flooding, tidal, um, and then also having a coastal element, which you will, um, being on Florida's coast. So part of the vulnerability assessment also looks at things like sensitivity analysis, where you take an inventory of community assets, such as your population, your structures, economic functions, and you quantify measure the impact of sea level rise on those assets. That's just a little snapshot of what's going on in your vulnerability assessment um, that will be taking place in 2024. Next slide, please. So I, I told you a little bit about the regional state and kind of the, the big picture. Now we're gonna zoom down to what residents and your municipality are doing to improve resilience. Yeah, thank you, Mo. Um, and we're going to start with sort of residents and um, that home um, scale of different strategies people can take to 
Um, not only do things like conserve water um, and reduce um, amount of runoff that's coming up our landscape, um, but just ways that even just at the home level, um, you can help with things like reducing flooding, you know, within your um, streets and neighborhoods. So one of the big things that we talk about within extension um, is um, how much water we use um, on our lawns. And um, in Florida, at least, um, as much as 50% of the water that we use um, within our home is used outdoors on our lawns with irrigation. And so extension um, horticulture agents are often um, educating and promoting about um, watering efficiently and using things like um, rain sensors um, and um, kind of upgraded irrigation systems so that way you are watering your lawn. Um, last, if you can think about just this past year, we've been sort of in a drought and then just last week we've had all this rain, right? So um, probably your lawn is like extremely happy <laughs> that we've had rain now, but um, if you have um, a smart system, an irrigation system, it would help you to water less when you have weeks like we just had where there was a lot of rain that happened. I calculated yesterday, I saw like 10 inches of rain just last week, just at my home. So um, just so just thinking about how much water you use outdoors um, and also inside, but here specifically outdoors, um, that could help reduce runoff um, and water coming off of your landscape and going into local stormwater systems and neighborhood streets. Next slide. Um, we also often talk in extension about Florida friendly landscaping and Florida friendly yards. And so the strategies used under this particular program discuss things like efficient irrigation, planting plants in the right place, um, the right plant in the right place. So um, planting plants together that would need less either fertilizer or water or using um, native plants where once they're established, you don't have to fertilize or water as much um, and encouraging pollinators. So planting plants that would provide sort of a backyard wildlife sanctuary um, for pollinators um, and other um, animals and birds, if, for instance, that might be coming to your yard. Um, Florida Friendly Yards often also talks about things like maintenance and thinking like about minim minimizing turf as much as possible, um, pruning when necessary and planting um, and thinking about when you do plant, how large potentially that plant is going to get and planting it appropriately um, where it can grow um, to mature size and not necessarily um, harm either your home um, or other plants in your landscape. Um, and so your extension office here, um, that this is not my area of expertise, but we do have um, a horticulture extension agent, urban horticulture, who teaches many classes throughout the year that talk about Florida friendly landscaping and appropriate plants um, and fertilizer and watering for your yard. Next slide. Um, and then just things to think about even within your own home. Again, sort of going back to reducing the amount of water you're using and water that potentially could be coming off of your landscape or off of your property and going into a local stormwater um, system or your local neighborhood. Um, so turning off the water when you don't need it, reusing potable water if possible, sweeping your gutters and your porches so you're reducing the amount of um, nutrients like leaf litter and other things that could go into a stormwater system. Washing your cars at a commercial car wash, um, that is a very big benefit because it reduces the amount of um, pollutants from the soap and stuff that comes off of your car from getting into a local stormwater system. And commercial car washes, you know, manage the stormwater basically on site. Um, so that's not washing into our local water bodies. And then using a rain barrel so that way when there are times when it does rain a lot, you can store that water and then use it um, instead of using potable water, use that um, water from the rain barrel to water plants and other things um, within your yard, helping you to reduce money because you're not using potable water um, and just um, reducing that amount of water that's going off of your yard even for having it going into a rain barrel. Next slide. 
Um, and then this is uh, from a document from Brevard County Natural Resources that has a um, low impact development and green stormwater infrastructure, um, basically um, document. And so they um, highlight these kind of three different types uh, or four different different types of practices that you can do um, within your yard. I already talked about the rain barrel. Um, you can also talk, um, look at disconnection of roof runoff. So potentially reducing that um, runoff volume and providing water to other landscaped areas. So sort of moving where that water goes, so that it's better used within the landscape. Um, rain, gardens, rain gardens, which is something that um, people have been excited about to talk with us um, as we've had a couple of community events. Um, you know, actually, you know, putting in a rain garden within your home and looking at maybe some low lying areas where you can have that storage of water so it stays on your landscape um, and on your property versus going into the street into the stormwater system. And then grassy swales, which is just an area that can collect water. Um, usually this would be something like that would be like along a roadway, like at the edge of your property where the water can collect versus instead of going into the street. Um, and that just allows the water to slowly kind of percolate back um, into the groundwater system. The next slide. And so I just wanted to highlight um, rain gardens because this is something that people have um, talked to us about, asking about how they can potentially do this and actually since we've been talking about it so much, I've even looked at a part of my yard where I'm like, oh, I want to put a rain garden in because I get a lot of water that goes here and it would be really nice. So um, Hillsborough County Extension has this great um, document that talks about um, putting in um, a rain garden into your um, home and they have a, a manual specifically for that. So that's linked here and I'll also put it in the chat after so you can go to it. And even though it is Hillsborough County, it is specific for Central Florida, so I feel like it would be applicable here. Um, so just the five steps for thinking about where potentially you could have put a rain garden, so picking the right spot, you know, especially an area that you know that already sort of holds or collects water when it rains. Um, outlining that garden and thinking about the depth of how um, far down you're going to be able to put that area, selecting the plants, and of course we recommend natives and um, you can go to the Florida Friendly Landscaping um, IFAS website to look at plants that um, don't mind having their feet wet, but also could potentially be dry in our more drier months. Digging it in, so doing the work and then finishing up. So um, these two links do show sort of that steps and give more details about these five steps and things to think about. Um, and I'll um, also put in the chat just these links so you can reference them as well. But it's, this is a great place to just start thinking about if you want to put a rain garden in, if you want to have more of a native plant landscape and how you can help to reduce um, water going off of your landscape into a local stormwater system and just keeping that um, on your um, property. Um, so, yep, next thing. So next I'll turn it over to Rachel where we'll talk more about city strategies um, that have been discussed, especially in um, local planning efforts. Thank you, Holly. That was really great. So I'll continue this off and let you know some of the city strategies that we are currently incorporating to improve the city's resiliency. First, I want to take a step back and go back to the surveys that we conducted earlier on in this project to kind of give you a better understanding of where we currently are with our knowledge and what some of our knowledge gaps are. So one thing that stood out to us as we were analyzing the results of both the um, staff and community survey were that 30 percent of respondents weren't aware of city efforts to plan for flooding that be rainfall, storm surge, sea level rise, etc. And 28 percent of staff survey respondents weren't aware of any city strategies to mitigate flooding that includes the city's resiliency plan, the city's comprehensive plan, and other strategies that the city currently uses uh, to mitigate flooding. Um, however, 75% of respondents have noticed a flood situation within the city in the last five years. So what that told us was that both staff and the community are noticing that flood situations are occurring um, enough so that they felt the need to tell us that in the survey, but um, there's a there 
is a portion of our community and of our staff that aren't aware of what the city is currently doing to mitigate these these flood situations. So that tells us um, that we need to to get that information out into the public and get that information to staff so that they could share with the public. And um, so one of the one of the strategies that the city has is our resiliency plan that I had previously mentioned. And I'm currently wondering if I lost my uh, screen share. Yes, thank you. <laughs> All right, am I back on? Yep, looks good. All right, so one of the strategies that the city uses is our resiliency plan. Uh, and it's called Resilient Titusville, and it is on the city's website. This is the plan that we have been talking about, where the vulnerability assessment will need to be updated for those new NOAA curves to align with the Florida State statute. So some of the, the areas, the hazards that the city is currently looking at are storm surge, sea level rise, the 100-year FEMA flood zone, high tide flooding, surge, surge and sea level rise and water quality. So these are some of the hazards that the city is currently looking at and that will be updated with the vulnerability with the updated vulnerability assessment. All right. And so while we already looked at some of the maps, the new NOAA curve maps, um, I wanted to highlight some of the other components of the resiliency plan that may be more beneficial to to the community in how we talk to our neighbors and we talk to to our the residents here in Titusville on what can be done um, to make the city more resilient. So at the end of the resiliency plan, there is a strategy matrix that includes some of the strategies that the city can accomplish and that our community can accomplish to make Titusville more resilient. And we'll go over a few of those in depth, but I wanted to let you know that the, this element is also included in the resiliency plan, and it's a really great tool uh, to be able to communicate this information to the public and so that we all get a better understanding of the different strategies that are available to us that will allow us to be more resilient. So some of them um, include living shorelines, which can be done by both by both the city and and residents. Uh, Titusville, a lot of the shoreline is currently residentially owned. So this is a really great strategy uh, for collaboration between the city providing the education on how this can be accomplished and then residents being able to install living shorelines um, within their property. And then we have flood proofing structures, which is another really great strategy that could be accomplished by both the city and residents. Um, obviously the costs here probably inflated a bit with the recent inflation going on, but just to give you a better understanding of what the different strategies that you can use, or you can think back on how you've already incorporated this into your own property to feel a little bit more comfortable with your own individual resiliency. Um, here are some more, we have structure hardening, permeable pavements and green parking, which is included as a low impact development solution and rain gardens, downsprouts and harvesting, which we just went over. So all of this and more can be found within the resiliency plan. Um, so I'll go back to the matrix and each of these strategies um, have their own little blurb within the plan. And this is a really great tool that we all can use when we are doing education and when we are talking to our neighbors to make sure that not only we're resilient, but those around us, those around us um, are also adopting these best practices. And then from there, I'll go into some more specific uh, strategies being used, used within our departments. So for example, our, our public works department regularly cleans ditches, inlets, and checks that stormwater pipes are clear of any blockages. And um, this is done before hurricanes and or tropical storms. So as we mentioned, uh, as Holly had mentioned, that when you clean your own, um, sweep your own gutters, you know, this is the city's equivalent of, of accomplishing that before, before any major uh, storm event. And then there's also repair, replace, and slip line stormwater pipes to maintain system functionality, add additional underground stormwater storage, 
use swales and ditches to manage localized flooding issues. These are all done within our our um, our stormwater division within our public works department that help keep our city resilient in face of natural disasters. Uh, additionally, we want to be resilient in terms of the health of the Indian River Lagoon. And so um, I put a link in at the top there, and I wonder, Holly, how quick you are, if you can find that link online and share it in the chat <laughs> as I'm talking about it. Um, but the city follows the in the Northern Indian River Lagoon Basin Management Action Plan, which we commonly refer to as a BMAP. And the BMAP highlights the um, levels of nitrogen and phosphorus um, that targets we want to get at to have clean and healthy waterways. So some of the projects the city has done has included 10 baffle boxes with three more upcoming, um, floating wet, wetlands islands, we already have six complete, and stormwater ponds, um, five complete of those. So the baffle boxes are kind of the more smaller localized um, nitrogen and phosphorus removals. The floating wetland islands, those are usually done within our our city, the city owned parks within those uh, smaller stormwater ponds. And then the five completed stormwater ponds are some pretty big ticket items that the city has been able to complete. And a really good example of this is the Space View Park here in downtown, where um, it's not only a stormwater um, stormwater pond that that does benefits for the lagoon, but it's also a really great place to go for a walk and see all of the um, amazing monuments that the city has to highlight the space program. Um, so there are mutually beneficial items that not only protect the lagoon, but also can provide a uh, beautiful recreation for, for Titusville residents as well. And then from there, I wanted to, to, to highlight the Save Our Indian River Lagoon uh, sales tax that was passed here in Brevard County and what the city is doing um, within the Save Our Indian River Lagoon um, Forum. Um, so one of the projects that is upcoming within the Save Our Indian River Lagoon here in Titusville are the Septic to Sewer Program, which we're gonna be starting outreach and education on um, for these two areas, the South Washington Avenue and River Edge Drive. And the Septic to Sewer Program is a really great way to to reduce the um, nitrogen and phosphorus entering the lagoon from that from our resident from a residential perspective. Like I said, a lot of the shoreline here in Titusville is residentially owned, and there are quite a few um, homes along the lagoon that still are on a septic system, and it can be very expensive to to switch from a septic system into the sewer system. And so thankfully with this Save Our Indian River Lagoon sales tax, you know, we have we are starting the ability to um, go from from a septic system to a sewer system, which will reduce the amount of excess nutrients going into the lagoon. And then um, I also wanted to highlight that the Save Our Indian River Lagoon uh, had a project plan update as of February 7th, 2023. And I really recommend that you you view this project update to see not only the projects that are happening here in Titusville, but along the county and how, how we are all collaborate, collaborating, working together to improve the health of the Indian River Lagoon and um, know where that sales tax is going. Um, and I'm really proud to say that Titusville has been a city that has, uh, has gone above and beyond and has one of the most projects out of any of the municipalities here in Brevard County. Um, and then I also wanted to highlight this poster that was done with the Save Our Indian River Lagoon and, um, program. And this is a really great poster to share again with those who are, are not here at this webinar. And it can be found, um, it can be found at the Save Our Indian River Lagoon webpage. And it really shows you how, what causes the pollution in the lagoon and then how we can help restore the lagoon. Um, so because part of this webinar is it's considered a community training and what we're hoping is the outcome of this webinar is you're now able to feel confident 
in the information that you have to share it with your neighbors, with your with other residents here in Titusville, so that we can get this information out to more people, um, so we can do better, be better stewards to to the environment. So this is a really great poster that really summarizes everything that's kind of going on in the Indian River Lagoon, and um, that there are solutions available that we are currently working on, and that we would like to start doing in the near future to help the health of the lagoon. So I, I uh, implore you to check that out. And I will bring, I'll let Holly uh, take over again to go over the ABT framework to help you with, with facilitating those conversations, how you can structure, structure the conversations. So um, Holly, the floor is yours. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, one of the things, um, that we did within this project, which um, Rachel um, alluded to, is we did a um, staff training where we talked with staff about many of the same things we're talking with you today. And I think one of the important things as not only scientists, but as government employees, you know, trying to talk with um, others about work that's being done and, you know, why it is that we um, work on the different projects or science that we do. So as a scientist um, and as an extension agent, you know, one of the biggest parts of my job and is and for any extension agent is to just try to provide the science in an easy understand way for it so that people can relate to that and understand why it affects them and why they should care. And so when I was thinking about science and storytelling, I found um, this um, book and this information, um, the sources on the bottom, but um, Randy Olson, who um, talked about how science can be a better storyteller, basically. And so he came up with this ABT framework. He didn't really necessarily come up, came up with it, but he um, heard it already happening within storytelling as far as like movie storytelling um, and how that can be related to science. And he um, is using that to do trainings um, and to help government organizations and science organizations to better be able to tell their story. So the framework is called the ABT framework and that just stands for and but therefore. And so your narrative should talk about a series of events that occur in the search uh, for a solution to a problem. And so you're talking about at the beginning where the story starts, um, making sure you're showing agreement between you and the person that you're talking to so you can better understand each other as to why this is a problem. Um, and then but, which creates the tension. If you think about a, a story, like a movie story, like something happens um, and it's, there's a contradiction and then there's a consequence to that and hoping to find a resolution. Um, next slide. Um, and then he talks a little bit more about kind of shaping that narrative, just trying to make it a little bit stronger. And so he talks about um, what the, pro you know, figuring out what your problem, what the problem is, um, thinking about the and, so what happens in the ordinary world that we can all understand, but if then you're bringing back that and why do we care, what's at stake, bringing in kind of like the feelings of hope and fear or fear and then, but therefore it's, the basically highlighting as to why we're doing this, what the solution is. Um, and so you can find this um, ABT framework online and I highly recommend just looking at it if you're just trying to think about how best you can take any of the information we talked about today and create a short narrative that you can share, you know, with friends and family and others that you may be talking about, about the work um, that the city is doing. Next slide. And one of the kind of examples that the, um, Randy Olson gives when he's talking about how, how these framework can be seen in all different types of talks or speeches or way, you know things that people have said. He, ref often he references the Gettysburg Address. So this is a paraphrase by um, the speech by Abraham Lincoln. So um, it's starting off with the and, so we are a great and mighty nation, and then now the but, so now, we're engaged in a horrible civil war that we cannot allow to destroy this country. Therefore, it's up to us to make sure that the souls lost in this battle did not die in vain. So you're, he's in this very short paragraph summing up basically what he said in the speech, but um, showing that that um, framework at the end, but therefore framework 
um, can highlight why it is that we're doing what we're doing, what the problem is, um, and how we can um, find solutions to that problem and work towards that. Um, so I will um, next turn it over to Mel, I believe. Next slide. Mo, do you want to do the Mentimeter now? Yeah, yep. I'm going to share the screen for that. So we've talked for, I think, about 45 minutes on resiliency. And this may look like deja vu but we're asking you once again, what does resiliency mean to you? Has your idea, your definition of it changed? Um, please go ahead and say again, type in what does resiliency mean to you? And if you um, need to bring up the browser again, it's www.mentimenti.com and the code is 2471-9021. It can be your exact same answer as you had before. <laughs> there were some great answers before, so. I know, they were really spot on. <laughs> I think there's a bit a bit of a delay in when people type and it goes through the <laughs> through the menti server but so far I've gotten one answer <laughs> I won't show them yet I'll wait wait until a few more come in So far, I still only have one answer. Does anyone else want to add anything about what resiliency means to you? Did we confuse you? <laughs> Well, per okay. I've got three answers now, so. Yes, everyone has a lot to think about. Yeah, <laughs> and also I know it's a lunch and learn, so a lot of people are probably eating their lunch and <laughs> what happens when you eat your lunch? Maybe you get a little sleepy afterwards. Oh yeah, okay. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and show the answers for that. You can continue to answer that question. Um, if you happen to maybe have been multitasking and hop back on and want to answer this question. Oh, we have four now. Um, strategies to improve the environment and better handle local threats. That's an exclamation. Um, how to change actions to save resources and prevent pollution. And uh, yes, I, I'm hoping that also begins you know, right, right at your own home or workplace. How to prepare to respond to shocks and stresses. Use our knowledge, empirical, scientific, to overcome difficulties. And resiliency is the action of change to recover quickly. Oh, well, thank you very much um, for your feedback. So if you look back to the beginning, uh, before you even got onto this webinar, and then after listening for 45 minutes, has your definition of resiliency changed? Yes, no, or not quite sure.
I feel like this is almost like a fundraiser here watching this column grow. <laughs> So it's uh, it's been an overwhelming yes, and and that's a good thing. I think a lot of times um, you might be focused on what your passion is. Um, maybe it's the environment, maybe it's something social, something to do with people, or even um, the economy. And and you can see that resiliency spreads across all spectrums, and they're it's interrelated. And then finally, this is the last question we're going to ask you. What is something that you took out of today's session? Something that you may act upon maybe today or in the near future, um, or, or even something that you're, you didn't know before that um, is being worked on behind the scenes, either by your city, the region, or the state. And this is an open-ended um, answer, free response. So far, I have a couple of answers. If anyone else wants to type in, what is something that you took out of today's session? And I'm going to go ahead and display those. Oh, actually, four. Um, yeah, Sorrel. We, we've been saying that, and I was like, what, what is that? Is it S-O-R-R-E-L? No, it's Save Our Indian River Lagoon. Great organization. Uh, Rain Gardens, very popular at our community events. Um, all people who visited our table often were interested in rain gardens. How to change my daily actions to improve the environment. We need more details regarding the city plans. What are the exact projects and timelines planned? Um, that would be content for uh, a follow on. Yeah, um, webinar. that's a really good question. Even small changes can improve the environment we live in. When everyone makes these small changes, they equal a big impact, certainly. <laughs> Our little actions might have a big impact on the resiliency of all the community, which is that that's to see a couple of those answers like that, because the, I think Rachel in the community survey, it was something like 75%, the bulk of people, residents think that there's nothing they can do to, um, to help in the resiliency effort. So I'm going to yeah. hand that back over to you. Oh, use local species. Yes. Mm -hmm. so Florida native don't need the irrigation, fertilization, <laughs> the herbicides. All right, so uh, thank you all for giving these answers. And um, as I mentioned in the in the uh, slide, there was an update to the Save Our Indian River Lagoon project plan. Um, so you can see more details. A lot of the city efforts that we are currently that we are currently doing to um, create resiliency are are within the Save Our Indian River Lagoon uh, project update that Brevard County put out, um, as well as um, an update regarding city plans um, will hopefully come when we do the vulnerability assessment update. Um, and so those those two those two plans can show you a little bit more detail about um, what the projects are and what timelines are. Um, but I'll definitely note that and uh, hopefully have more information if we do any future engagement and outreach on what the uh, city plans are. Um, but if anyone had any other questions, you can type them in the chat. Um, Bill, I see your question about the stormwater runoff. And uh, yes, there are so many multiple sources of pollution um, you know, that enter the lagoon, uh, stormwater runoff being one of them. Um, 
the uh, information about septic tanks has come to us from some of the um, highly regarded uh, scientific staff at the um, at the um, St. John's Water Management District uh, that let us know the percentage that they are estimating of pollution coming from each of the sources. And there is no one source that they told us that um, more so than the other there. We have to improve all of the different areas where we are are where pollution is coming from. And there's current infrastructure improvements happening right now at Sandpoint Park that will hopefully continue to reduce the stormwater runoff from Sandpoint Park and um, hopefully will continue efforts to try to increase the monitoring of, of pollution that's happening there. Um, if there are any more questions, we have three more minutes. I'll, we'll try our best to answer them. But if not, um, you know, thank you guys so much for joining us for our uh, for our webinar um, and hopefully we'll be emailing you out the link so you can share this with your friends and family here in Titusville soon and um, it will be on our web page as well. So thank you so much for for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. All right, um, since I'm not seeing any further questions, um, I think I will end the recording and end the meeting. So.